Now, before we begin, get ready with the tissues, cause today's recap is quite touching. Alright, roll the clip. She was unlucky. None of the medicines were working. We, we had no choice but to give up. Those were the words that Kanchi Akutani had to listen to when his sister passed from her tumor. He couldn't accept that. There had to be something. Since then, he threw himself into medical research. He had such a laser-tight focus on his craft, and he worked himself to an early, early grave. Like, literally. When he woke up, he found himself in the body of the young Pharma de Medicis. The boy was struck by lightning before Kanji's arrival, and interestingly enough, he suddenly bore the holy mark of the Panakthios, god of medicine. As Kanji tried to navigate this new existence, he learned that Pharma hails from a noble family of medical practitioners. What's more is that his holy mark enables him to create and destroy all matter. With this new lease on life, Kanji resolves to live as Pharma and elevate the medicinal knowledge of the universe, which is still equivalent to that of the Middle Ages. Using his modern know-hows, he can utilize his abilities for good and develop illness-curing medicine. In fact, that's exactly what he did for the dying empress when he developed the cure for her tuberculosis, also known as the White Death. His immense display of magic and knowledge of healing arts makes his father, Bruno de Medicis, realize that the pharma in front of him isn't the son he always knew. For three months, pharma has exchanged knowledge and information with his father, Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno, no. No, that's not the right franchise. Now the man brings up that contingent of the Novalute College of Medicine is demanding that the recipe for the White Death's cure be made public. Bruno believes that the medicine's composition can only be made by his son, so he made an excuse. After all, this is a miracle brought to them by the gods and there's no point in telling others right now. As much as Pharma appreciates Bruno's help, he would have to disagree. He actually plans to make the production method public. Bruno is shocked by this. Ordinary people can make this medicine? They can make it without divine arts? Pharma believes that such knowledge should be distributed to more people so that things progress faster. But when Bruno asks if that's also Panoctheus' will, he just smiles. But inside, he thinks that it's not by the will of a god, but by his conviction as a pharmacologist. So Bruno acknowledges that Panoctheus has a hand in this. To pharmaceutists, Pharma's belief is heresy, and because of this, some people will try to get rid of him. The dangers are not limited to just the pharmaceutists either. There are rumors that someone actually attempted to bring the White Death into the palace. This means that there is some political ploy to depose the Empress. Pharma tells him that he finds this hard to believe. Even if infected, the probability of developing the White Death is a small 10%. Bruna quickly asks if that 10% is also knowledge given to him by the Panakthios. Uh, <laughs> something like that? Well, Pharma quickly changes the topic to the Empress's appointment and leaves the room. Now alone, Bruno can't believe how much knowledge this Pharma has in his hands. Soon, worry starts to strike him as he thinks about the accusations of heresy. He then remembers a man in jail, talking about the truths of the world in his bouts of madness. Now at the palace, Lord Noah leads Pharma to the side and tells him that the Empress is already considering what reward to give him. Seeing Pharma's surprised reaction makes Noah pinch him. Cause like, duh, of course she'll reward him. He saved her life. No one has ever provided service like Pharma did in this nation. Noah then inches towards him and asks about what Pharma might be interested in. You know, money, status, Land? Because surely there is something he wants, even if it's a goal for the future. With Noah promising not to tell anyone, the boy reveals that his goal is to open a pharmacy, one that will provide affordable medicine to everyone. Aww, ain't that so sweet? His goal from his previous life, he is still aiming for that. In Empress Elizabeth II's bedchamber, the royal is in high spirits as her condition is improving daily. But Pharma tells her that even if there are improvements, one can't tell how a patient could be the next day. Uh, as true as that is, Elizabeth was once in a state of despair, yet Pharma was the only one who gave her hope that she would survive. 
Their conversation takes a more somber tone as Elizabeth shares how easily her value as a ruler plummeted when news surrounding her inevitable demise came out. It just makes her wonder, will she ever be fit to take the throne again? Parma then asks her, Your Majesty, who was it that still needed you, even when you felt that way? Her son, Louis. Farma tells her that, as a mother, she can hardly be called a worthless person to the prince. There are so many people in the empire who adore and need her. Empress Elizabeth II can never become worthless as long as these people exist. This puts a smile on Her Majesty's face, and she says that his words are medicine to her heart. Before Farma leaves, he tells the Empress, Humans move continuously towards death. Your Majesty has experienced death once already. I'm certain your majesty will live this second life even better. The empress is shocked by this. It's almost as if someone else was speaking. What does this boy mean by a second life? But he doesn't give her an answer and tells her that he has to go. Several months later, a much healthier empress Elizabeth II summons Bruno to appear before her and speak about his son. Now attending the grand ceremony is Pharma, who's looking really sharp and dapper. He wonders if he's even suited to attend such a grand ceremony. Of course he is. Bruno reminds him that he is the son of an Archduke and he must stand proud. Bruno and Pharma arrive at the hall, and before them is the magnificent Empress Elizabeth II in all her glory. Archduke Bruno is given the territory of Marseille, a place known for its abundance of medicinal herbs. She then calls upon the apprentice royal pharmaceutist Pharma de Medicis. Everyone turns around to look as Pharma approaches. With this, Pharma is promoted to official royal pharmaceutist. He even gets the official badge! Not only that, but she will grant him special permission to open a pharmacy in the capital. Looks like the Lord Noah didn't keep his promise of keeping it a secret. However, what Pharma doesn't expect is how the construction of his pharmacy is going to happen right away. Like, he hasn't processed it yet, and he's already have to work on that. Because, like, how could he just turn all of these people away when they're there to fulfill a job for him? Everyone is eager to help build his dream. His teacher, Ellen, is even here to assist him. Pharma doesn't want to rush this, but he also doesn't want these people working for him to lose their heads socially and physically. Ellen reassures him that he has unlimited resources because he has the Empress's favor. At this, he begins to sketch his pharmacy. With how precise his sketch and plans were, construction went on without a hitch. But now Pharma has to come up with a name. Pharma has always dreamed of having a pharmacy, but he just never imagined it would be a parallel world pharmacy. <laughs> you said it, guys. You said the thing. The builder quickly comments that parallel world pharmacy sounds like a great name, so... Sign maker, do your thing. Ellen is impressed and says that a name like this will stand out. Even then, it doesn't need to be called this to stand out. No one has ever done anything like this, especially not an Archduke. A pompous man suddenly approaches, and assuming Pharma to be a regular employee, he asks for the proprietor of the pharmacy. After Pharma introduces himself as the owner, the man tells him he's Varen, the head of the St. Flu Pharmaceutics Guild. If you think that everyone on this show is sweet and wholesome, you're dead wrong because Varen here woke up extra early to be a hater. He comments that Pharma's medicine will probably be hard candies, seeing as he's so young. Pharma quickly stops Ellen from doing anything, and instead, he replies that he will be giving dosage forms similar to candies like lozenges. Varen just laughs at this though. Pharma then asks if he has to join the guild for him to operate his pharmacy, but according to Varen, the guild does not offer membership to aristocrats as they are only commoner pharmaceutists. But if he wants to join, they can accommodate him. Okay, seriously, what's, what's up with this guy? Pharma says he won't, which prompts Varen to say that nobles approach things very differently. He even expects that selections will be pricey, and it's quite the opposite, he is selling at low prices. This invokes a very violent reaction from Varen. Ellen has to interfere. With a menacing aura, she threatens Varen that he'll have her to deal with if he tries anything against the shop. This has the man running straight for the hills. 
Aside from the little hiccup, everything's going well so far after that at least. The inventory is complete, but what will they do about accounting? His maid Lottie volunteers, and though she has decent arithmetic skills, Pharma hesitates to allow this, but he does give her a simpler errand-related jobs, which makes little Lottie do a little dance of joy and gratitude. But alas, the question remains, who will do the accounting? Upon arriving home, Pharma notices everyone in a downcast mood. It turns out that Lord Cedric is retiring so that he can rest his knees. Lord Cedric is the person who manages the estate's finances and... Wait, did... Did I just say right now that he manages the estate's finances? <gasps> That'll settle it. With Bruno's blessing, Lord Cedric will now work for Pharma, who also promised to heal his knees. Not just that, but Bruno also gave Pharma some gold to help him with his venture. And yes, Pharma does realize that the true reason for Lord Cedric's dismissal is that Bruno wanted his son to have an accountant he can rely on. Even if he doesn't say it, Bruno loves Pharma very dearly. Aww! Go, Bruno! Now it's been a month since Parallel World Pharmacy <clears throat> opened, but business isn't going as well as Pharma hoped. Plus, commoners usually go to the shops of commoner pharmaceutists. Nobles have a physician or a pharmaceutist at their beck and call. It doesn't help that he's not just any noble either, he's the son of an archduke. Commoners just find that intimidating. As Ellen, Cedric, and Pharma are thinking about how they could possibly increase store traffic, Lottie comes in with her results from a survey she conducted with the townsfolk. It wasn't just a few people, she got a hundred. Wow, what a go-getter. The commoners expressed the following. The imperial seal outside scares me. I don't know the etiquette for talking to a noble, so I might slight them and be punished. I don't have the appropriate clothing to enter a noble's shop. The knights outside are intimidating. The owner is a child. Oh, okay, now that... Ugh. Pharma doesn't have a choice in that one. Another one said that the prices are quote-unquote negotiable, and they interpreted it differently. So, it might be better to just be upfront with the prices to not cause a misunderstanding. Another problem they have to face is that some commoners can't read. Well, it looks like they really have a lot to do if they want to connect with the masses. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like, it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.